I want to say, first of all, I want to thank you for your conference. This is a well-organized camp meeting. My note says that I am to start preaching at 728. Not 730, but 728. I appreciate the invitation to come. I've been blessed by being with you. It's hard for me to be away from home. It's hard for me to be away from my church. Um, That's where my heart is, in that group of people, as we meet together, as we celebrate what God has done, it's hard to miss. I hope you feel that way about your church. Camp meetings are always special. But there is truly something special about just being a part of a community, and I hate to miss out. And so I don't take very many appointments that, that stretch over Sabbath. I like your theme, consumed with Christ and his cause. Boy, if we could just live it now. If we could experience that, consumed with Christ and with his cause. If we could begin to live that, this world would never be the same. I hope that that can come alive. I appreciate the vision of your conference. This whole idea, this vision of share the life. I have been thrilled to see so many people commit their lives to giving Bible studies, not not only going door to door and sharing the word of God, but working with local churches to enable and empower and to release lay people to be involved in ministry. You know, one of the incredible things about the Seventh-day Adventist church is there is a place in ministry for everyone. You know, in some churches it isn't that way. Years ago, my brother became a Baptist and started attending church and was actually uh, leading out unofficially for someone else in a Sunday school class, and he decided that he wanted to start offering a Bible study in his home. And the thing began to grow, and and, and people started to come, and it wasn't very long before the church came knocking on his door and said, now, you know, we're not sure that we want people studying the Bible away from their house, away from church, And, and pretty much shut it down. They felt like, at least that church, and I know it's not all churches of that faith, but they felt like ministry was to be left to the paid pastors. It's not that way in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, and so what that means is there is a place for everyone. As a lay person, I was challenged that there really isn't anything that a lay person cannot do within the Adventist church. I mean, the door is wide open to give Bible studies, to teach, to hold evangelistic meetings, to do just about anything, and I'm grateful for that. Because if we're going to wait for just a handful of paid professionals to do the work, we're going to be here a very, very long time. And so I, I like your theme, Share the Life. It's a wonderful thing. And as I said, I've been thrilled to hear the stories of how God is changing people, how God is using people, and God is blessing in this. And and I, I just, I like a conference with vision. And that's what it is. To, to, To challenge the status quo and to say, we could do better. We could do more. We could be a greater blessing to the people of our community. So I know God is going to bless. I know he's going to bless because it's his vision. You know, a few years ago, some people gathered in a room a long way away from here, but they gathered in that room and they began to come together and they were talking about the church in North America And as they got together and began to pray, they began to develop a sense that they wanted to see something more happen in the church in North America. I I like reading the review. I love the stories that are told there of of faraway places where evangelists go or pastors are, are preaching the gospel and not hundreds but thousands of people are giving their life to the Lord. 
It thrills me to hear that, but it also makes me cry out, Lord, why not here? Why not here? If it could happen in other places, why can't it happen here? And as that group began to meet together talking about the growth of the church in North America or the lack of growth, they begin to get a sense that maybe it was because we had not embraced that gospel commission the way that we could. Maybe there were churches and pastors that had kind of given up on evangelism. John shared with you, I'm a product of evangelism. I'm a product of public evangelism. I'm a product of expensive public evangelism. It's near to my heart because it changed my life. If that group of of Adventists in Tulsa, Oklahoma hadn't sacrificed and committed themselves to be a part of that meeting, I don't know what would have happened in my life. I I don't know how God would have led, but they answered the call and I responded to the invitation and my life has been forever changed. That group of people thought, you know, what, what would happen if we as a people really became serious about evangelism again? And so out of that was born the idea that we're going to set aside a year and call it the year of evangelism. I hope you heard about it. It was last year, 2009. We called it the year of evangelism. Kind of Kind of odd that we would have to set aside a year for something that God really wants us to do all the time, but we thought if we could make it a focus and get people talking about it and get people thinking about it, then maybe something great would happen. We had seen that a lot of churches, elders, pastors, other lay people had kind of given up on public evangelism, and we thought if we could encourage them to re-engage, what could happen? And so the word kind of went forth. We're going to declare 2009, the year of evangelism. We're going to challenge every administrator and every pastor and every church to become intentional about evangelism. See, the original plan was in 2009, it was uh, started out to be the year of pastoral evangelism. And 2010 was to be the year of lay evangelism. How could we as pastors ask lay people to do things that we weren't willing to do? And so 2009 was to be a year that that we would re-engage the pastors and we would invite lay people to come alongside and do some training and resourcing. And then in 2010, release that army of lay people to do evangelism. When word got out, people began to talk about it. People began to think about it. People began to plan. People thought, well, yeah, you know, this this would be a good thing. Not everyone, mind you, but there was a buzz in our division about that. We saw some conferences and some unions really commit themselves to do it. We said in in that little room as we were talking, what could happen if every church engaged in evangelism in 2009? What could happen? And so a bold goal was set for 100,000 souls. 100,000 souls. Normally in North America, we baptize about 32,000 a year, 32 to 35. But we really believe that if, if this could take hold, we would see God work in unprecedented ways. People, some people got excited about it. They committed to it. Money was allocated. Plans were made. And we saw churches become revived. We saw lay people and even pastors renewed with this idea that God was at work and that God was still blessing evangelism, and we, we saw whole churches revived with the spirit of evangelism. Did we get 100,000 souls? No, we didn't. I know some were just thinking that was way too big, but nor did we get every church engaged in evangelism, but this is what happened. We baptized more people last year than any year in the history of our church that we can remember, that we were keeping record. 
We went from 33,000 to about 45,000 or so. I don't even know what the final number is, so don't hold me to that, but I know it was well over 40, and it was approaching that 45,000 number. 12,000 more people were reached just because we said, we should do this. We should, we should kind of cast this vision for this is what we should do. And friends, I, I believe, I believe in vision because if we don't sit around sometimes and, and really begin to look within ourselves and look at what's happening and, and, and to be bold every now and then, nothing will ever happen. So I'm thankful that your conference leadership has vision to say that if our people will become engaged and begin to live evangelistic lifestyles, if we can begin to share what we have with others, I know great things will happen. I'll be watching from afar. I'll be praying. Friends, don't, don't let the opportunity to go by. You know, I, I believe that we are on the verge of something really spectacular that's about to happen. I really believe it. Maybe it's part of that, what happened in 2009, but I, I hear it all the time. I see that there is a renewed interest in living evangelistic lifestyles, of witnessing, of doing more Bible studies, of holding more evangelistic meetings, because I believe God is at work. God is trying to tell us he wants to finish this work. He wants to come. As much as we long to be in heaven, I believe God wants us there even more. It must break his heart to see what is happening, to see the pain and all of that, and to know that heaven is waiting, but there is a little more that we must do. Friends, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of finishing the work. In fact, that's why Adventist Fellowship was started. It was, it was all about that. I shared this morning a little bit about the, the growing frustration I had of why the church wasn't really growing. Why it was that if, if we're really the remnant church or the remnant people, why isn't the church growing? And, and I remember as I, was, as I was sharing this with some that would listen to this new believer, I always kind of got the same response. Now, Bill, God knows we're not ready. So he's, he's kind of holding things back. God has people everywhere that he wants to reach, but he knows that we're not ready, so he's holding them back. And when we are ready, he'll come. They'll come. We'll see a great, a great outpouring of the Spirit of God, and we'll see people flock to the Lord. It was almost as if we were fulfilling some sort of divine plan of God by not being ready. And so I thought, well, why don't we get ready? What, what, what if we could become that church that God could trust, that he could send anybody to us, and we would accept them and love them and reach out to them and to see in them a person that Jesus died for. What if we could become that kind of church? What would happen? What would happen if we started a church that its sole purpose was about reaching the lost? What would that look like? What would that be like? What could happen if that was what the church was all about? We, we said, well, if that's true, then evangelism would have to not be an event, not be a program that we run, not be something that we do just so we can check it off the list, but evangelism would have to permeate everything we do. We call it a culture of evangelism. We talk about it, but it's hard. It's hard to, to adopt that kind of culture you see, not just that we would hold a lot of evangelistic meetings, but that every ministry we had would really lead people to the Lord. Children's ministry would no longer be about just 
keeping kids out of the service or offering, you know, a program here or there, but children's ministry really becomes child evangelism. That Sabbath school isn't just that thing that comes before the main event called worship, but Sabbath school is truly a place where men and women can invite others to study the Bible. You know, we're, we're in the Adventist church where the church is experiencing significant growth. Sabbath schools are evangelistic. Did you know that? They really are. In fact, in, in some places in the world, Sabbath school attendance exceeds church attendance. Doesn't happen here. But the reason is because it's evangelistic. Because men and women are inviting their friends and neighbors and others to study the Bible with them. Health ministries would be about evangelism. Hospitality meals would be about evangelism. Socials would be about evangelism. That was our vision. Whatever we're going to do, it's going to be about evangelism. And almost immediately, people came out of the woodwork telling us why it wouldn't work. Have you noticed some of the ones that don't want to do anything don't want anyone else to do anything? I couldn't believe it. It's not like I was asking for their money or even for them to participate. They didn't want to be a part of it, but they didn't want anyone else to do that. And so we heard all the stories about why it wouldn't work. It costs too much. That, that people just wouldn't respond. You'll, you'll wear out the community. You'll wear your people out. You'll burn out. You know, all of the reasons that they begin to offer. And all I can say is, thank God, I was young, dumb, and naive. You know, Pastor John, I, I didn't even know there was a book. I didn't know any better. We didn't know any better. As that, as that group of five families began to just come together and pray and seek God, we just believed that God would work out all the details, that God would work in amazing ways. What has happened? I can tell you I'm living a dream. I am living a, a I mean, it is just the greatest thing to be a part of a church like that. I've been there for uh, going on 11 years now, and I'd be happy to go 11 more if the Lord doesn't come. But here's, here's why I bring all of that up. And John hit on it, and I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it. I don't believe it's something unique to a group that's especially talented. We were just some businessmen some regular people holding jobs, housewives. There, there wasn't anyone that I would say, you know, in the Bible there's, there are 10 talent people, there's five talent people, and there's a whole bunch of one talent people. That's what we were. We were the one talent people. And I, and I don't believe that it's something unique to Tulsa. I hear it all the time that, well, Tulsa is an easy place to reach people. Ask John about that. Ask evangelists that come. It's not any easier. You know what? People are people. They really are. They all have the same basic needs in life. And to say that one area is, is any more difficult than another, and, and there may be some truth to that, but it discounts what God is able to do in a person's heart. Because this is what I've learned about uh, 10 years of doing evangelism is long before we get there, God's there. I've had people that have walked into my meeting opening night. I've shaken their hand. They say, I want to be baptized. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't have a clue. You know, I haven't preached to you yet. I got 25 sermons you got to listen to first. You got to learn this and this and this and that and that. And then if you survive, we'll baptize you. <laughs> Only to find out. God got there ahead of us. That through their Bible or through someone else or through television or whatever else, that God began to work in that person's heart and they were ready to be baptized. We see it all the time. Evangelism is about God going before us. 
And so I want to say to you, you're sitting here today, and God has put something in your heart to do for his kingdom. He's put it there to fulfill it. He's put it there for you to do it. He, now is the time. So many people sit in church going, you know, one day, one day, I'd really like to do something for God. You know, one day doesn't come. If, you're, if you have that in your heart, today's the day. Today, today is the day. Tomorrow never comes because there's always another day. The story of Adventist fellowship is not what a few people did or what happened in one city. It's about what God can do if you'll put his kingdom first. I hope you'll, as you go home from camp meeting this year, I know the longest drive in the world is from camp meeting to your home. I remember what it was like when I first became a believer and I'd go to camp meetings and I'd be so stirred, I'd be challenged, and I'd make maybe a commitment there in my pew as I was listening to a speaker. And in that 100, 150 miles between there and home, something happened to that commitment. I hope that doesn't happen. You know, I like to hear stories of people who don't give up. The people who persevere. People that hang in and hang on. People that even in the face of challenges will persevere. Quitters aren't much of an inspiration, are they? Hardly ever hear them talked about. But yet, you know, as I think about it, we are a generation of quitters. I'm a quitter. I admit it. All you have to do is go to my home, go into my garage, and you'll see monuments to the fact that I'm a quitter. You see, I live out in the country. I got a big shop building. I got a barn. I got this. They're all full of projects that I get inspired when I'm walking through the home improvement stores. And I go out and I buy all of this stuff and I take it home and I say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And it sits there as a testimony to the fact that I'm a quitter. Think for a moment what your life would be like if you were not a quitter. If I weren't a quitter, I'd be able to play the piano. I'd be able to play the guitar. I'd be able to play drums. Today I play none of those. I'd be able to speak Spanish. I'd be able to speak Italian. But I can't. I struggle to master English. I'd have the world's finest baseball card collection, coin collection, and stamp collection. Today I have none of those. I would be a professional bowler, golfer, hockey player. I'd play for the NFL and the NBA. <laughs> I had a busy childhood. What can I say? The list could go on and on. It seems so easy to give up. It seems so easy to be inspired one moment and in the next give up your dream. To be honest, most of those things I don't think the world misses. But that's not true in everything. I've been thinking a lot about my life lately. You know, each year, I, I, we as a church, I, I encourage my church to read through the Bible every year. We read the Old Testament and the New Testament twice within a year. And as I've been reading through the Old Testament, there's one particular verse I keep coming to that I don't like. I don't know how else to say it. I don't like it. Maybe you've come across it too. It's Psalms 90 in verse 10. Anybody know what that verse says? In Psalms 90 verse 10, I'll read it to you because you're, you're not going to want to mark this one in your Bible. <laughs> the days of our lives are 70 years. 
And if by reason of strength they are 80 years. I did the math. I've only got 8,000 days left. (laughs) Maybe through some miracle, the health message, I might get a little bit more, but I wasted half my life doing things I shouldn't have done. And so I'm not even sure I've got 70. 8,000 more years. Everybody's trying to figure out now how old I am. I mean, 8,000, excuse me, days, not years. (laughs) Days. When I go to bed at night and I'm waiting for sleep to overtake me, all I hear is tick, 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 tick. When I get up in the morning, I hear tick, tick, tick all day long, tick, tick, tick. The days are slipping by. I cannot believe that I stand here 48 years old. I feel like I ought to be 20 again. It's frustrating to to reach a point in your life where you know that the best is behind you. Never going to be any stronger than I am. Never going to be any prettier than I am. Never going to have any more hair than I have. I'm depressing myself. (laughs) And some of you are sitting out there going, 8,000 days sounds pretty good to me. (laughs) More than anything else, I want to finish well. I want to finish well. I do a lot of funerals. We come together and we talk about the person's life and what happened in their life. And, you know, in moments like that, it's never about how much money they made or how big a home they have or any of that stuff. How will it end for us? Somebody did a survey and they said that even in the church, only about 30% of the people finish well. 30%. So I thought about that. What is finishing well? look like for me. And and I've come to two important things that would have to happen for me to finish well in life. Number one is this, I want to be more in love with Jesus at the end of my life than at the beginning. You say, well, that's a no-brainer, but you and I both know that's a challenge. Because we even talk about that new believer in their first love, and we in the church go, oh, they'll get over it. You know, they'll calm down. They'll they'll get to be like the rest of us. I want to be more in love with Jesus my last day than the first. All you have to do is look around and see the places in your church, the empty pews that were once filled with people who worshiped, people who sang those songs, and people who knelt and prayed, and they're gone. And they're still alive. They're just no longer followers of God. The second thing that's important for me is for me to realize the purpose, and to accomplish the purpose for which God created me. You see, I don't believe I'm an accident. I believe that God's intentional in everything that he does. I believe God is purposeful. As we read the the story in Genesis, God is very meticulous, orderly. He doesn't just throw things into being. That if we're here and God has created us, then he's created us for a purpose. Somewhere, somehow, I fit in God's great plan. So there's a purpose for my life. What a tragedy it would be if I live my whole life and I never, I never come into alignment with that. I never experience that. I never live that out in my life. To me, finishing well 
would be to experience that, to live out that call that God has placed in my life. You see, God has created all of us for a purpose. There's a calling in your life. God calls us. First, he calls us to be his child. That's the most important thing. God calls us into relationship with him. God sees us, sees value in us, that God wants to be our father. So he invites us to become the sons and daughters of God. But the call doesn't end there. He calls us to be servants. He calls us to be witnesses for him. But I believe there's something more that God is calling us to do tonight. In our scripture reading from Luke chapter 5 is a story about the disciples that are fishing. They're, they're fishing, and it seems like every time we turn around, that's where they're at. I've tried fishing. I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. I've tried and tried and tried, but it's boring. <laughs> I don't eat fish, but if I wanted one, I know where Walmart is <laughs> or whatever. But I, but I understand there are some that love it, live it, breathe it, and so you can have my spot. The, the disciples were fishermen, and it seems like every time we turn around, that's where they are. That's where Jesus found them, according to, to, to Luke chapter, or excuse me, Mark 1. They're fishing, and Jesus walks by, and he calls them. Here in Luke 5, they're back in the water fishing. Luke 5, verse 1, so it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put him out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. I believe in this passage, I really believe, at least in my life, and I suspect in yours, that God is revealing to us what he wants for us. I believe God wants us to launch out into the deep. We have been hanging around the shallow end, many of us in the church for a long, long time. And in the shallow end of things, you know, it's fun for a while, but I can tell you, you can get pretty bored in a hurry. I believe what God is, is calling us to do is to launch out into the deep. A few things that I want to share with you this evening about the deep. Number one is this, the deep demands greater commitment. In verse 4 he says, after he had stopped speaking, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. All eyes were on Jesus when he was speaking. When Jesus stopped and he spoke to Peter, I can imagine all the eyes went to Peter. This was Peter's moment. I've had some of those moments in my life where I've heard God speaking to me. I mean, not in an audible way, but through his word and as much as I hate to admit it, through my wife, that God speaks to me about something, and it's my moment as well. It's Peter's moment. The question is, what would he do? Verse 5 says, But Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word I will let down the net. Do you hear what Peter is saying? Well, what he's saying without really saying it, 
Jesus, we're tired. Don't you, can't you tell? We've been at this all night long. We've been working. We have not slept. We have been toiling all night long, and we have caught nothing. Jesus says, let down the net. He knows all of that. I don't know why I always feel compelled that when God tells me something, I have to give him the laundry list, as if he doesn't know about why I don't think that's a good idea. But God is patient. He allows me to vent for a while. As long as I come to that same conclusion, okay, I don't understand. That's really what Peter's saying. Lord, I don't really understand this. We've been doing this all night. In fact, what he's really saying is this past evening that we have toiled all night indicates to me that any further fishing is futile. Yet Jesus called Peter to a greater commitment. And I believe that that's what God does in our life. All the time, every day, every morning starts over with our God. And when we wake up and we report for duty, you know what God wants? More of us. He wants a greater commitment. And I say to you, as my brothers and sisters, I know we've been busy. I know we've been working hard. And yes, we have seen some success. But friends, there's much more to do. Much, much more to do. The Northwest is filled with people who need Jesus. Your community in which you live is filled with people who need Jesus. Your neighborhood is filled with people who do not know our God. You know, what keeps fueling our passion in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Because I, I can tell you, some people say, well, you're a church plant, you can get away with that. I, that may be true for the first year, but I'll, I, I will assure you of this, that any time you're in a church, the natural tendency of a church is to rest. The laws of physics applies to a church. The whole idea of friction, the whole idea of objects at rest want to remain at rest. It's all true. And, and so I've actually had people come to me and say, Pastor Bill, we should stop all this evangelism. I say, well, why is that? And they say, well, we have enough people now. <laughs> you know, the parking lot's getting kind of full. The church seems to be full of people. We got enough people to make our mortgage payments. You know, we're, we got enough people that we've got enough ministries going on and things are going pretty good. We're, we're no longer, you see, the thing about church planting, when you plant, you're in survival mode. You have to win, people. You have to, you have to reach out to the community. You have to be serious about growing church because you won't survive. We were so hungry when we started. If we had a visitor come to church and they wouldn't tell us where they lived, we followed them home. <laughs> I, I, I am, I'm not kidding. <laughs> when John talks about all those people greeting him, you know, you know it, we were hungry. But something happens along the way. When you, when you go from that trying to survive mode to a little bit of success mode, and, you're, and you've got things covered, you've got enough people to do this ministry and that ministry, and you've got a little bit of money, and you're in a building, the tendency is, we don't need to do this anymore. As I'm listening to their argument, I was shocked. I really was. We can stop doing evangelism. 
And at that moment, I realized that our vision, or at least some of our vision, had dropped from others to ourself. It was no longer about them, but it was about us. And so I simply asked this question. Do you think there is one more person out there? One more person that would give their heart to the Lord if we tried? If we kept doing, do you think there's one more? Well, yes. And I said, when there's no more, that's when we'll stop. <laughs> you see, I, I believe that our church is the best opportunity that the people of my community have to hear the Adventist message. We're there for a reason. And you're there, wherever you are, for a reason. It's a lighthouse. It is a place that is to, to shed light so that when people come, they can hear the wonderful message that we have about Jesus and his love for them. So how's God going to reach them? If there are people in our community that God wants to be reached with the gospel, how is he going to do it? And this is what I came to the conclusion of, we're the body of Christ. And when God is at work in my community, at least from my understanding, he usually works through people. I mean, that's how God works. He's the head, we're the body. If the head wants something done, he sends the hand. He sends the feet. He sends the voice. We're the body of Christ. Therefore, we're here to serve him and to serve his purposes. We are his hands and his feet and his voice. You know, we, we use a phrase at least... Uh, where I come from, people often will say, well, I belong to this church or to that church. And I've always thought that to be a very interesting phrase. I belong to this church. I have a lot of people that will say, I belong to Adventist Fellowship. And that's interesting because I wonder, when somebody calls them from the church and asks them to do something, If they belong to the church, then it seems to me the answer ought to be yes. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you for asking. It will be my pleasure. Instead, what we get is, well, I'm kind of busy. You know what? That's not really my gift. Isn't there somebody else that could do that? You ever heard that? Anybody here ever had the privilege of serving on a nominating committee? Ever had to make the calls? These are people who belong to the church. You know, I have a car. It belongs to me. When I go out in the morning and it's two degrees below zero and I put the key in, my car doesn't whine to me about, oh, it's cold. I don't want to start. I don't want to go out into the snow and the ice or whatever else. The car is there to serve me. And so it is, if we belong to the church, we exist to serve the church. But even in a greater sense, if we belong to Christ, we ought to serve him. Whatever he asks, we should do. If you will make yourself available to him, God will use you in incredible ways. He will. You know what, I've had people, I've had people that we've lost contact with and I've been so bold to pray in the morning, God, I don't know how to reach this person. I don't have their phone mail or their email. Would you bring them into my path? And God has done that. You know, as we report for duty every morning, God, would you send me today wherever you want me to go? Will you give me some divine appointments Will you put people in my path that I could witness to, that I could share the love of Jesus, that I could share what you've done in my life? Surely there's some people that would be impressed by that enough that they might just say, if God could do that in Bill's life, he could do it in mine. 
make yourself available means that you've got to make a greater commitment. Here's number two, going deep demands greater faith. It really does. The deeper you go with God, the more faith is required. Why is that? Because everything about our relationship with God involves faith. We are saved through faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. And I'm going to tell you this, we serve by faith. Greater service demands greater faith. In Luke chapter 5, verse 4, Again, listen to this. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. That's the flesh speaking. Here's the faith. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. You know what I've learned? It takes faith to witness. It really does. It takes faith to witness. It takes a belief in God that God is going to honor what he said he will do when we speak for him. Because our natural tendency is to think, oh, that person isn't interested. That person will never listen. Or even worse, I don't know what to say, and so I'm not going to say anything. It takes faith to witness. It takes faith to give a Bible study. It takes faith to hold an evangelistic seminar. It takes faith to serve. But often we hear the call to launch out into the deep, and we are stricken with fear. We're afraid that we'll fail. Because the deep is a place where we're taught to fear. The deep is a place that's outside our comfort zone. The deep is a place that we have learned to stay away from. But I'm going to tell you the deep is where God is calling us to serve him. Somehow we've associated it as a bad place. But I want to make an admission to you here tonight, and that is I'm in deep water. I am over my head. Every day of ministry, I was not trained to be a pastor I, don't, I didn't get that book that has all the pastor answers in it. You know, I don't know. Every day, I'm in deep water. It was that way when I was a layperson as well. When you serve God, you serve him in such a way that he always takes you a little bit beyond what you're really comfortable with. The deep is where Jesus wants you. The deep is the place where you have to depend on him and not you. You ever taken a child from the shallow end and pulled them into the deep? You know what they do? They cling to you. They hold on for dear life. That's what we do with Jesus. That's what Jesus wants. He doesn't want us to do anything of our own. He wants to be the one that works in us and through us and for us. But I want to warn you, it's not easy being in the deep. But it is exciting. It'll get your heart pumping. It it will get you going. You see, when I became a Christian, I, I had seen a lot of people that had given their heart to the Lord, and for some reason, it didn't last. See, I grew up with a bunch of kids that did drugs and did other things. And every once in a while, one of my friends would come to me and announce, I'm not going to be hanging around you anymore. I found Jesus. And I, I, was, I didn't have a problem with that. But there were way too many times when that same person a few months later was back in my world and no longer doing that. And it made me skeptical. It really did. If, if God is all this powerful, if Jesus is, is, is who he claims to be, why do so many people, I don't know, fall out, drop out, whatever it is? And so when I gave my heart to the Lord, I told the Lord, God, I want it all. 
I, if this isn't going to work in my life, I don't want it to be because I didn't do what I needed to do. So I said, Lord, I'm going to surrender everything. Anything you ask me to do, I'll do. And I meant it. And I, I truly believe that I have endeavored to keep that promise. In fact, my church found out about that. The nominating committees found out about that. <laughs> and I, I could say to this day, I don't think I've ever told the church no. I don't think I've ever said no to the nominating committee. When somebody asks me to come and do something like speak at a camp meeting, if I can fit it into my schedule, I don't say no. Whatever God has for us, we need to be willing to say yes. I, I was tested on that almost immediately. I was baptized October 15, 1983, just in time for in-gathering. <laughs> I, I can tell you've heard of in-gathering from your laughter. Yep, we did in-gathering. We did it when you went out on the street and you knocked on doors and you asked for money and all of that. We do that in Oklahoma. In fact, a pastor didn't get vacation until he got his ingathering goal. And so they were very serious about it. And I can remember sitting in the church shortly after I was baptized and the pastor began preaching and, and I could tell something was really troubling him and he made this earnest appeal for people to come out that night, show up and help in gathering. I'd never heard of it. But the pastor was asking, and I decided I was going to say yes. So I showed up. In 10 minutes, I was in the back of a car of a guy I'd never heard of with a can in my hand. And he pulls up on the side of the road, and he says, okay, work this side, and down the other, I'll pick you up over there. I said, what? What am I supposed to do? I really did. I mean, there was no on the job. There was no training. There was no preparation. All I did was have a can that looked like a bank, and I was supposed to go to the door with a little bit of literature and beg for money. It was not a great experience for me that night. I wish I could say, Oh, wow, I felt the presence of God and the power. Of, I, I, wish, I wish I could say it was a wonderful experience. I walked up to the first house shaking like a leaf. I knocked on the door praying no one would answer. The door opened. I said, hi, I'm Bill. I'm from the Adventist Church. Do you have any money you can spare? Surprisingly enough, a few people had pity and gave me some money. <laughs> Got a lot of doors slammed on my face. Couldn't understand why God would ask me to do that. By the third house, I was praying for nine o'clock to come. In fact, I'm going to tell you, if I had had a cell phone they would still be looking for me. <laughs> Man, we took Bill out on in-gathering. He got raptured or something. Never saw him again. I didn't have any way of getting home. All night long, I knocked on doors. Deep, deep water. I will say this. God was merciful Every once in a while, I had to get back in the, in, in the uh, you know, back seat. There was somebody else, and the driver would always ask, how much did you get? And man, this lady next to me, it was, it was first, first time she got in the car, it was $20. I had three. The next street we worked, she had almost $60. I had eight. It was, it was terrible. It was terrible. To the last few moments... And I knocked on a door, and I told, I'd, I'd refined my spill a little bit. Don't remember what it was, but they invited me in, and it was somebody that had just gone through some terrible experience about losing a loved one. 
and I put the can away and I began to witness to them about the hope of the resurrection and uh, prayed with that person. It was a wonderful experience. That one house. The rest of it wasn't so wonderful. But that's, that's what happens when you say yes to God. It takes commitment. It takes sacrifice. It takes great, great faith. You see, it takes faith to listen to God and not the crowd. Maybe, you're, maybe you, as a Christian, have been thinking, you know what, I need to get involved in ministry. I need to start witnessing. I, I want to be involved in giving Bible studies, or I want to work in the children's division, or whatever else. And people are telling you, oh, let someone else do it. It takes faith to listen to God and not listen to everyone else. If Peter had held a vote that night, should we throw out the nets? Probably wouldn't have done it. But he was willing to do that. You see, sometimes God asks us to do things that are contrary to our own feelings. That's why it takes faith. Lord, nevertheless, at your word, I'll do this. You see, what we see in this story is God is asking Peter to do something that he had just failed at all night long. Caught nothing. Not a thing to show for it. And Jesus asked him to do it some more. I believe that's the way God works in our life. He brings us back to those points where we have failed in the past. He says, now will you do it with me? At my word, will you do that? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you may have tried things in the past. You may have done some things in the past that you failed at and, and you don't understand, but it seems as though God is asking you to do it again. That takes faith. But if you listen to what God is saying through this story, he's saying, Peter, try again. I believe God wants us to try again. There are some things in our life that we may have failed at. Try again. Jesus says he'll bless. One of my favorite verses from the book of Proverbs is 24 and verse 16. In Proverbs 24 and verse 16, it tells me the difference between someone who succeeds and someone who fails. And it's not just that a person who succeeds never messes up, never makes a mistake. But notice what it says here in Proverbs 24, 16. For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. I am so grateful. But the difference between someone who succeeds and someone who fails is not someone who falls. It's what do you do after you've fallen? Friends, I've lived that verse. I've lived those words. My conference president, the one who called me into ministry, much to my dismay, used to introduce me and talk about what I like about Bill is he's not afraid to fail. Not exactly a, but it's true. Well, I am afraid to fail. Nobody likes to fail, but I don't allow that to keep me from trying anyway. What, it, what he really was saying is, hey, here's a guy that's failed a lot. And that is true. We tried a lot of stuff. I still make mistakes. There are still things that we try that we fail. John, I have a horror story. It was our very first meeting before you got there probably one of the reasons we called you. We launched our church. We had our very first worship service. It was the second week of February. We gathered together to worship. To, you know, we didn't know how to even do this. Never started a church before, so we had our first worship service. The second Saturday was the day we started our first evangelistic meeting. And we advertised, we, we really went all out. 
and, and we advertised for this meeting and we didn't know any better so we had, we, we, I didn't like the idea of going into the meeting not knowing how many people might come or if anybody would come, you know what that's like. And so we said call to register. So we start advertising and the phone is ringing off the hook. We have 500 people registered for the seminar. You've been in that church. Holds 200. We're thinking, what are we gonna do? So we go out and rent a hotel room. Holds almost 1,000 people. We think 500 register. Just think about how many people are gonna show up. So we switched all the advertising, advertising because we were doing radio and TV, and we called 500 people back. Told them, don't go there, go there. It was a circus. We had 27 people, there were 15 adults. 15 people trying to hold a meeting with 500 visitors. Can you imagine that? 500 people didn't show up, but 400 and something did. I was the speaker. My first meeting in this, in this, I walked out, got on that dais or whatever you, dais, dais, platform, looked out over those sea of faces, said, hi, I'm Bill McClendon. I want to welcome you here. This meeting is sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're so happy that you're here. About 20% of the people stood up and walked out. How do you keep going after that? But you do. I heard later somebody, um, somebody that we ended up baptizing said that when I said that, they nudged the person, the person next to him nudged him and said, well, I'm getting out of here. She said, no way. If he's brave enough to say it, I want to hear what he's got to say. <laughs> the next night, 220 people came. The next night, about 125. I'm praying, God, I'm not gonna have any people left when this meeting's over. I gotta shorten the meeting. I mean, we were just hemorrhaging. Just kept spiraling down. I can't, I can't remember what it was, but God was gracious. And God did bless. I think we baptized about 10 people. You say amen, but 500 people there? And all you end up, we doubled the size of our church though. <laughs> I wanted to baptize about 300. Don't know what I would have ever done. But you know when that meeting was over, you know what I felt like doing? Giving up. I can't believe we just, Wasted all that money. Giving up. That's what we're tempted to do when we think we fail. But you know what we decided? That night, when it was all over, we're going to do another meeting. You know what? Our leader here, Bill, needs some help. We're going to call a professional. And we're going to bring in a professional evangelist. And we're going to have a meeting. And you know what? We're going to get better at this. And we're going to work harder. And we're going to keep trying. That's what it means. That's what God is calling us to do. He brings us back to that place again and again where we have failed. And sometimes it's really hard because we give it our all. What, what, what Jesus is saying to Peter is, I know you've worked all night. I know you're tired. But get this. Work a little harder. And then I'll bless Peter did it, and God did an incredible thing. How does Jesus take us from where we are to where he wants us to be? By pushing us. You ever watch a film entitled Facing the Giants? It's a Christian film talking about a, a football team, and there's Blake. There's a scene where Blake is doing this death crawl. And the coach is down on his hands and knees, walking with him, screaming in his ear enthusiasm. Keep going. You can do it. You can do it. Try harder. I believe sometimes that's how the Holy Spirit works in my life. 
He gets down next to me and he screams in my ear, you can do it. You can do it. Get up. Try again. And I'll help you. You see, the journey into the deep water is really to help us learn more about God. In Luke 5, verse 8, the response, when Simon Peter saw it, the miracle that God had done, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. There's just... Uh, let me say it this way. When we go deep with God, we're invited to know him in a very special way. He becomes so personal. He's not just a God of everyone. He's, a, he's my God. He's my Savior. He's my encourager. He's my confidant. He's my friend. The results of obedience are recorded in Scripture for us. It's in verse 6 and 7. It says, And when they had done this, they caught a great multitude of fish. I'm telling you, there's something about being obedient to the voice of God that will bring fruit into our life. Going deep is a call to a new way of life, and that's really where the story ends. God reveals to Peter as well as to the rest of the disciples, you're no longer going to be fishing, bringing fish from life to death, but you're going to be bringing men from death to life. I've got a better work for you. I've got a greater task. It's an incredible story of God's work in a person's life. God may be calling you to a new way of life. God might be saying to you, you know what? You sat in the church long enough. The church has served you long enough. Now it's time for you to get involved in service. It's time for you to get involved in ministry. He may be saying to you that he wants you to go into the deep. It was 25 years ago that I was sitting in a church right after I'd been baptized. And our pastor had a vision. He had a vision for Revelation seminars. They had just come out at that time to happen all over our city. That he would advertise on the radio and people would call and based on their location, we would assign them to a particular area. He preached. He talked about a drug. I'd spent a good 10 or 12 years of my life on drugs. And when he mentioned the word drugs, I, I thought that's kind of odd. And so I, I really started listening to him. And he talked about this drug that's called soul winning. He said it's addictive. He said, once you get a taste of this, you'll never be the same. He made this appeal. He cast this vision. He asked for volunteers. He was looking for 12 people to hold these meetings. The organ began to play. I mean, this was a call. Nobody moved. I had only been in the church a few months. I thought, surely he's talking about some of these older people, some of these more experienced people. But nobody began to move. And then God reminded me of my deal with him. I'd never say no. And before I knew it, my hand was up in the air. And this is really quite the amazing thing. As my hand went in the air and I stood up, others stood up. It was hard being the first one because I was almost sure the pastor would say, uh, Bill, you hadn't been here long enough. Sit down. But he didn't embarrass me. It was something that was going to happen six months away. You know how it's pretty easy to volunteer for something that's going to be a long way away? I don't know why that is, but man, think six months, anything could happen. So over those six months, he trained us, he resourced us, he equipped us, went through every lesson. 
as the date began to get closer, I wasn't sure if I'd made the right decision, but I'd made a commitment and I was going to follow through with it. And so it was just a couple weeks out and the advertising started. And every time I went to church, either in prayer meeting or a a small group, I, I was there two or three days a week. The secretary, would, would, she informed me one day, she said, oh, uh, Bill, I want you to know, you got the biggest location there is. <laughs> I said, okay. And then a couple days later, I would go, and, and she would say, and guess what? A pastor registered for your seminar. <laughs> Wasn't too happy about that one. Then a few days later, she said, Bill, guess what? I said, I don't even want to know. She said, and this was back in the early 80s before all this home video stuff. She said, somebody's coming to your seminar and they want to videotape it. I said, what did you say? She said, sure, he won't mind. The day came, it was on a Sabbath, it was gonna start Saturday night, so I took all my little box of materials and all that, I went to this library. It's a pretty good sized room. I had about 40 people that were pre-registered for the seminar. I got everything ready. Meeting started at seven, by 3.05, I was kinda waiting for the crowd. It was a long afternoon. About five o'clock, the first one showed up, the guy with the video camera. He's running wires and doing all of this and getting it all set up. And there was just a little room. I didn't want to be out there because I didn't have anything to say to this guy. I didn't didn't know what to do. So there was a closet that I just hung out in for an hour or so. (laughs) You know, I thought at seminar, you got to walk out on stage. They wouldn't know it was a closet. So I just kind of hung out back there, kind of letting everybody do their thing. And it was about 45 minutes before it starts, and I really began to experience fear. I was about ready to throw up. I'm not kidding. I mean, I was that nervous about this. And I finally reached a point where I just said, I can't do this. And then I got an idea. It dawned on me. Our pastor wasn't doing a meeting. He was back over in the church in his office. Didn't have a cell phone then, but there was a phone out in the foyer. So I went out to that payphone. I called the church. He answers. I said, Hubert? Yeah, that's who he was. Hubert Cisneros. If you ever see him, tell him you know about him. I said, Hubert? He said, Bill, is it okay? I said, I, said, I got a problem. He says, what's the problem? Do you, do you got everything? You got, I said, oh, I got everything. That's not the problem. He said, what's the problem? I said, I can't do this. He said, what's wrong? I said, I just can't do this. And he said, look, Bill, you're prepared. You've got all your materials. You're going to do fine. Click. I reached in my pocket so fast for the next, I think it was a dime, I don't know if a dime or a quarter, I called him back. He didn't answer. (laughs) I don't think there was a church member more angry at his pastor than that night. I was mad. I couldn't believe in my time of need my pastor wouldn't come through for me. You see, here's, here's what he knew, and here's what I knew, and here's what you know. He could have done it much better than I did. He had done, I don't know how many of them, he could have done it better. He would have been more professional. Probably even more fruit would have come from it. 
I never understood for the longest time. I shouldn't say never. For the longest time, I did not understood why he put me in that position until the meeting was over. 24 nights or however many nights it was, people came. I wish I could say I was eloquent. You know, it was just a, a, a phenomenal meeting. You know, that every time I opened my mouth, you know, God put the words in there. Maybe he did, but it didn't seem like it to me. I stuttered and I repeated myself and all of that. But at the end of the meeting, I can't remember if it was five or six people gave their heart to the Lord and were baptized. Bless their hearts, those people that videotaped the thing came every night. Came every night. At the end of the meeting, they said, oh, do you want a copy? I said, no. I think half the time they probably didn't even put a tape in it. They said, we started this thing. We don't want to embarrass him. Tell him, ah, it's not that good. We don't want to tape it. I figured out when it was over why he made me do it. Because it's part of the experience that God has in our life. It was a deep water. My pastor knew I needed to be in the deep water. And yeah, he's the one that threw me there. But God met me there. And God blessed. And God sustained. And you know what? The pastor was right. I got a taste of that. When the meeting was over, I picked out a spot on the front pew the day of the baptism. And as I watched those individuals walk down into that water and see some tears in their eyes. I wept like a baby. It was so meaningful to me. What God did in their life, but even more what God did in my life, made me think, oh, how grateful I am for what God has done for me, that he would allow me to be a part of what he is doing in the lives of others. I'm a carrier. I've been infected by that disease. And I'm a carrier. And it's contagious. I hope, I hope that whatever it is that God is laying on your heart to do for him, you'll do it. You're not the best person. You're not going to be the most gifted or the most talented person in your church, most likely. But God will use you. God will bless you. You are the right person. You see, there's a great lesson that the disciples learned sometime later that I've learned in my life. It was the day when they were in the boat and they saw Jesus off in the distance and he was walking on water. And basically, Peter thought, well, that's pretty cool. I'd like to do that too. So once again, Jesus says, okay, come. Peter had his moment that day. And so he gets up, and you know the story. He takes his eyes off Jesus, and he begins to sink. Peter learned what you and I need to learn. And that is, whatever is over our head is under his feet. God can see you through.